We're going to turn on to our next uh, panel discussion, which is called Solving uh, for Net Zero by 2050. Um, and this is going to bring together um, voices from industry and from academia. And uh, we thought that it might be nice for Dr. Paul Dean from UCC, maybe just to take a moment or two to help frame the discussion and the rationale behind this panel. So I'll just invite Paul. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. That's Bula Liv. Um, I was walking in this morning, being bathed in the beautiful Dublin sunshine after the four months of misery we had. I say, how am I going to use this three minutes and 44 seconds uh, to speak to you today? And I went into a coffee shop on the docks, and there staring in front of me, like all good coffee shops, there was one of these life-affirming posters on the wall. Um, it had a picture of someone sitting at the end of a jetty, their legs in a lake. There was a canoe with nobody in it, and there was a forest, and the person was looking wistfully over it. And the slogan said, it's not about the destination, it's the journey that matters. And as life-affirming and as useful as that is, it's actually very correct when it comes to net zero and our carbon trajectories. It's not just about get net zero as a destination, it's how you get there is fundamentally important. And we know this because of climate science. Climate science tells us that it's not about your future carbon pollution at some point in time, it's actually about your cumulative emissions across time. And time really matters, uh, really matters for us here in Ireland. Myself and my colleague Hannah Daly and Professor Brian O'Gallagher were in front of a Rockless Committee during the week talking about the necessity of time and the really good climate legislation that we have in Ireland. And actually, Minister Ryan, it's your legacy. You know, not, not, not writing you off, but it, it will be one of your <laughs> in, in, incredible legacies, one of your many incredible legacies. Um, and we should be proud of that, uh, Minister Ryan, because it's hard, it takes bravery, um, but it's right, right? There's science behind it. It's tricky, and as Minister Ryan said, look, we're probably going to miss our climate targets. We'll get there, but not in the time that we have, you know? Uh, we're doing better than expected, but not as good as we hope. Uh, but we will get there. Um, but it's not just about the destination of net zero. It's how you get there is really important. And actually, if we pull that apart, even though it's difficult, it's challenging. If we tease at it, and we look at it from a different perspective, there's a really interesting, interesting thing that's revealed. There's an incredible environmental dividend from limiting climate pollution in time because the policies that we have here in Ireland, they don't change necessarily what we have to do, they change when we have to do it. Time matters, it's not about the destination, it's the journey. Let me give you a quick example. The retrofitting housing scheme that Minister Ryan alluded to there. For every one house that we take away from polluting fossil fuels, this year, over the decade, right, a house typically on oil will emit about four tons of CO2 pollution. But over a decade, that's 40 tons that's saved. Do the same action in 10 years' time, that's only four tons. Same with electric cars. Every electric car that we take out of polluting fossil fuels today, get people onto buses, cycling electric cars, that's two tons in one year. But again, over the decade, it's a 20 uh, ton dividend. It's an incredible environmental dividend from early action. And today, you know, we're hearing lots of right things about the things that we have in Ireland, the technologies, the policies, the abundance, the resources, the people, the ambition. There's no deficit of any of that stuff. But it's not just about technology. It's about people and it's about time, okay? We have to act quicker. And as well, with all the great things we're doing, and the energy transition is happening in Ireland. We're all seeing it in our homes, in our families, in our farms right around the place. We are getting there, but our Achilles heel is we're not quick enough. Uh, we're too slow. As Alex White mentioned this morning, the title of this conference is Accelerate. We need to go quicker in Ireland. So, Derville, I'd be very curious to hear about the, the panel in terms of what we can do in terms of matching our ambition with agility and what we can do to hurry things up to accelerate things in Ireland, because it's not just about technology, it's about delivering them on the right time, being right from the right side of history, the right side of science. So the next time you catch yourself sitting on a jetty, legs in the water, staring out at an empty canoe over a forest wistfully, remember that it's not just about the destination of net zero, it's about how we get there and the time that it takes to get there is fundamentally important.
Thank you very, very much, Paul, and for laying down the parameters of the discussion and uh, to join us on stage to do precisely that, to talk about the, uh, the journey as well as the destination is Barbara Finnamore, Senior Visiting Research Fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, Serge Cole, who is the uh, Global Energy and Resources Industry Market Leader and Global Power and Utilities Sector Leader at Ernst Young, uh, Avery Johnson, who is the Associate of the Global Decarbonisation Hub and Global Chair of the Leaders 2050 and KPMG and last but not least, Jim Dollard, Executive Director, Generation and Trading at mm -hmm. ESB. So, there we go. <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay, thank you. I'm more than happy for another panelist to take over, Barbara, if you wish. Um, no. Do you know what? It's, it's been really, really interesting today in speaking to people um, over lunch as well, just about what Michael really talks about, the roller coaster of optimism and pessimism and certainly looking at the superheroes, the horsemen, and I think we've probably felt all of those um, emotions um, today. But Serge, I might just start with you, because you're just back from the World Energy um, Congress in, in Rotterdam. And I was just kind of going, what were the feels there? What was the whole sense, or what were the big, big talking points there? Well, <coughs> perhaps I would start indeed also with the roller coaster, right? I think there was a lot of conversation about you know, the mood swings, I would say, that we see in the energy transition um, only a couple of months back. Um, in COP, um, there was a lot of talk about uh, you know, everybody being surprised with the uptake of renewables. Everybody expected around 450 gigawatts, and to all of our surprise was 550 gigawatts, uh, primarily due to the Chinese really ramping up. But you know, a real acceleration. And right now, indeed, and we heard it also this morning, um, you know, a lot of talk about, you know, are EVs dead in the water? And I agree with the minister, absolutely not. There is still growth, but there's a contracting car market. Um, so there's lots more going on than just that. But so this mood swing, I think, was very tangible. A lot of conversation about, you know, what is real? And, you know, are the oil and gas industry, do they have more confidence as a consequence? I think in a way, yes. Um, but certainly also leading to other reflections in, in terms of acceleration. Um, the other thing that I would perhaps say is perhaps the vibe, yeah? So other than the vibes around the, the roller coaster, um, it's just looking at the, um, at the scenery there. Um, I was really impressed, if you will, by the size of the Chinese delegation, uh, clearly profiling themselves as the new clean tech leader. Um, and it was all about their tech and their ambitions. Um, incredible stance of uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, and you can see the commitment, they actually built an ecosystem and that was really intended, I spoke also with the uh, Saudi delegation, um, very, I would say, tangible how they want to be not just an old energy king, but also a new energy king and they don't see contradiction and I think they will maximize both positions. Um, conversations with the Americans much more around not clean, not green, but clean molecules. So again, also I think the oil and gas industry leading in heavily or increasingly heavily also into the energy transition. So this whole notion, I think, of you know, commitment, geopolitically speaking, I think also became very real um, in, the, in the just you know, looking at, at the conference. Maybe the, the, the second thing that I will say beyond vibe is maybe just what the discussion was about. Um, and I would say reflective of this, um, of this uh, roller coaster and the fact that indeed the energy transition, and transition will not be linear. Um, and clearly we see up exponential uptake of many different things. Um, the reality is also that, um, you know, we do need to move from talking about, you know, objectives and big goals and everything else, and let's talk about 2050 and can we still make it or not. They're, of course, important, um, but there was a lot more discussion around, you know, the actions that we have to take, which I think is a very positive one. Um, and I think specifically the more mature markets, um, I think, uh, are so, sort of, um, you know, staring at the reality where if we are indeed looking at exponential uptake, mm -hmm. things will get exponentially harder unless we do it differently, right? And so a lot of conversation around, you know, very practical things that we need to do now to actually be ready for the industrialization of the uptake, which we haven't really seen in any of our industries. We start to see some of that in renewals, but even in renewables, if we look at the numbers, I mean, we need to move from 550 right now. The commitment is to, you know, to triple renewable capacity by 2030. That means 1,000 gigawatts, not 550 per year as of next year, which we will not do. So actions, actions, actions. And the last thing is maybe for emerging markets. There we talked more about ignition, as in what are the conditions, or Global South, what are the conditions that need to be met to really get started. Um, thank you very, very much for that, Serge. Uh, Barbara, speaking of roller coasters, um, the US uh, election um, is going to be probably one of the most consequential elections in US history, if not world history, and coming in a year of really, really important elections. And it was 
Interesting and sort of depressing listening to Olivia Lazard, you know, earlier talking about um, the West has finally woken to the threats of both Russia and China. I know China is your specific area of expertise, so talk to us about what is really happening. And so interesting to hear them going out positioning themselves as green, clean and green tech leaders whilst uh, building ever more coal uh, plants. Well, well, the uh, horsemen of uh, the apocalypse and the saviors are both alive and well in China. They are galloping mm. as fast as they can, and they are enormous. Now, we're, t we're here today to talk about accelerating the race to net zero, but that's not going to be possible unless China, which is responsible for over 30% of global emissions, uh, drastically reduces them. And China did pledge to peak its CO2 emissions by 2030, though it did not indicate at what level. And it also committed to reach net zero for all greenhouse gases now by 2060. But last year, China's emissions rose by 5%, by far the largest of any country. And without China, our global emissions would have been flat last year. So what's the reason? One word, it's coal. Burning coal is the leading source of greenhouse gas emissions anywhere in the world. China burns three times as much coal uh, uh, as anywhere else. Much of that is for power plants. China has half of the world's coal-fired power plants, and a lot of it also goes to making half of the world's steel and half, half of the world's cement. So now, in 2021, the president of China, Xi Jinping, personally personally pledged to strictly control new coal-fired power plants. But what happened next? China had an energy crisis. Russia invaded Ukraine. And extreme weather events dried up all of China's hydro resources. We also had uh, spiking electricity demand in China, a lot of it because of the data centers that we were just hearing about. China has the second largest amount of data centers in the world, but also so much electricity and power is used to produce all the clean energy technologies that we'll be talking about, the, the, the electric vehicles, the solar panels, and so on. So that, those factors led to an enormous frenzy of new coal-fired power plants. So in 2022, China was adding two coal-fired power plants a week, and that just accelerated in 2023. But I think the pendulum is starting to switch. And that's because of the breathtaking growth of renewable energy in China. Just, just an example, in 2022, China added more solar PV domestically than all the rest of the world put together. And that's not it. Last year, China added enough solar PV to equal all of the EU's existing solar PV capacity. And the amount of new wind power that China uh, emitted or that China built was triple that built by the EU and the US combined. So the energy transition is happening. And last year, something happened that I w was so surprised at after, after 30 years of working in China. The amount of installed capacity of renewable energy in China exceeded that of coal power for the first time in China's history. And now, People are saying that coal may have peaked last year. And oil, same situation. China is the world's second largest consumer of oil, the largest um, importer. Pledged to peak oil by 2030, but that may happen a lot more quickly because of the heavy growth of electric vehicles in the world's largest uh, car market. Th China sells 30 million cars a year in China. Last year, one in three of them were electric. But this month, for the first time, China's uh, first two weeks of April, China sold more, e more than 50% EVs nationwide. So the, elect the energy transition is happening, but it's not enough. We keep hearing that peaking, peaking emissions in China is a first step, but it's nowhere near where we need to go to 
bring China or the rest of the world down to net zero emissions. And there are many, many challenges that China faces. We've heard a lot of them here today. Yeah, so, and I want to come back to some of those with you, Barbara, but uh, Jim, just to, um, you know, it's no longer just about connectivity and competitiveness. There is a huge security dimension. So Ukraine, Russia, further instability in the Middle East. And um, I suppose that Europe, what we learn through all these crises is that we don't necessarily have that same level of security of supply. And Ireland, of course, is at the very uh, end of a very, very long uh, gas pipeline. So what are we doing, or what is, is ESB in particular doing to, to, to reach that by 2040, to address all of those issues, security of supply, as much as all of the previous issues that were identified? Yeah, thanks, Sarval. So I suppose the first thing ESB is doing is set a very clear strategy. It's net zero by 2040 for the group, which is really important. When we heard this morning, 2050, 2070, 2080, we're saying 2040 to be at net zero. That is incredibly challenging. To put numbers on that, you know, in 2005, which isn't that long ago, 16 million tonnes for ESB in terms of generation emissions now. Last year, we were 5 million tonnes. And between now and 2030, we have to significantly reduce that again. Those are really difficult steps, but they have to be taken on the road to net zero. So how are you doing that? I suppose, firstly, it's investment. It's, we are investing both ESB itself within the generation business within ESB, but also through our networks business, supporting the whole rollout across uh, north and south of the island and investing about two billion a year currently, and that's expected to rise. So very significant investment from a generation perspective, you know, in terms of making that happen. We're investing in three different ways. One is in renewables. We, we need to rapidly grow renewables as a business from one gigawatt currently to five gigawatts. We'll do that across three core technologies, onshore wind, offshore wind and solar. And I suppose you need big pipelines. So we have a big pipeline of assets, uh, maybe 200 plus projects, 12 gigawatts to get to that, you know, five gigawatts by 2030. And it's a massive effort and it's a massive change change. So I liken it in my own head to we're going through the gears. The, the industry is not yet at full gear, but what's happening is the industry is feeding. There's a huge feedstock coming. There's a lot of projects that haven't come above the waterline yet, and when they come, you're going to see very rapid change in terms of outcomes. I think the second area we're investing in is renewables enabling, and this is really important in terms of how we utilize the grid, how we enable the grid to take ever more renewables. And you know, we have invested in batteries, we're rolling out more. We've invested in synchronous compensators, a really innovative project in Money Point in, in West Clare, and it's, it's playing its role. But also, as some of the other commentators talked about storage, I think Jim Gannon said storage, long term storage is going to be required in Ireland. I fully agree with that. It is going to be really important, and we're investing a lot of time both in storage itself but also in issues around green hydrogen and how can that be made work. The final piece, and, and relates specifically to your question, is around dispatchable generation. When you look at the transition we're talking about, so we have a big fleet of assets, existing assets, right across all of the, the technologies, renewables and otherwise. Job one, stop burning coal. So in 2025, we stop burning coal. That is absolutely number one. I used to work with somebody who said, if you've got a problem, turn off the tap. Don't start mopping, turn off the tap. We, we need to turn off the tap. Next year, we'll stop burning coal. The second issue is really around gas. We have an existing gas fleet. How do we make that more efficient? Thermal efficiency is back in vogue. How do we make it more efficient? And thirdly, how do we migrate those, those um, technologies to net zero fuels? We're thinking now about how they migrate to net zero fuels. New gas fire technologies, we are asking ourselves, well, in fact, the last approval we approved for a, net zero, for a gas turbine had to be net zero compatible by 2040. So effectively, those, that dispatchable generation is really important in the context of building a bridge from a fossil fuel world, a secure bridge to a renewables only world, and as we do it, consistently reduce emissions. So that's the, it sounds easy, it's a massive challenge, uh, but we're on the journey. Yeah, thanks. Every, um, despite all of the warnings and the horsemen and everything, there has been considerable pushback um, on the climate agenda. And it, that debate has become so polarized to the extent that phrases like ESG, inclusion, the just transition um, are treated by many with contempt and often they're dismissed as wokeism. And I'm reliably informed by my colleagues who are signing for us today that there is no um, I don't think there's any language yet in sign language for wokeism, is it? <laughs> Orla, I don't think there's one exists. I think we have to go and explain it, but it has become one of those toxic, toxic words. Um, Avery, and I'm just wondering, where do you see that 
momentum of the geopolitics landing with citizens and particularly our younger people, you know, because we kind of tend to think, you know, older fossil fuel. There are people who will literally fight for the right to hold on to fossil fuels. And then there is a younger generation, as, as, as Michael says in his papers, who it's unthinkable for them not to act on this agenda. So I'm just wondering on the, the wokeism kind of scale, what your thoughts are on the pushback. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a good question. It's um, certainly we've seen that polarization. I think the US is a great example. And you've you know, obviously alluded to this incredibly challenging election year. But it's not just the US. It's 49% of the world's population is voting this year. It's one of the largest kind of coordinated voting years we've seen in, in you know, decades. Um, and so there's this really exciting opportunity, but also huge challenge of how that's going to swing in the US and, and everywhere else around the world. And to your point, I think the polarization is obviously politicized and it's, you know, we can see that very clearly. But to your question, it is also generational. You know, I have the great privilege of leading a program called Leaders 2050, and it's a KPMG-led external facing network for young professionals who are interested in all topics around ESG, energy transition, and climate. And we've broadened that specifically because of the intersectionality of climate ESG and energy transition. And so when these questions were sent over, I, I thought, you know, I would only be doing my job to ask that group what they think, so it's not just my perspectives that I'm able to share with this group today. And it was so fascinating to hear both their responses and the responses that we had to a survey that we put out uh, just before COP last year, asking young people what their thoughts were on, on the COP agenda and what they rank as the kind of top themes. And just transition comes out by a country mile as being the most important. And when you ask for the qualitative feedback on that, why is just transition so important, their response is so simple. And I would tend to agree with it. Uh, if you're financing a transition that's not just, what are we doing? Gender equality falls into the definition of just transition. Jobs, nature, biodiversity, water, land use, agriculture, all of this is within a wider definition of, of just transition. And so this debate around is ESG dead or should we call it sustainability? Should we be rebranding? Should we be this? Should we be that? The pushback is often, it's not resonating with our clients or it's not resonating with consumers. It's not resonating with, you know, this, this resonance piece is so critical. And when you ask young people, they're so much more concerned about the speed of action rather than the syntax. Mm -hmm. If we're wasting all of this time asking senior leaders, should it be three letters? Should it be sustainability? Should it be this? The framework is the same. But part of the reason why there are those debates is around changing the terminology is precisely because there has been um, that pushback. I want to come back to you, Barbara, just um, was really sobering listening to Olivia Lazar talk about how Russia and China are not even years, possibly centuries ahead in the race for critical minerals in terms of long term strategic thinking and deploying, you know, that kind of diplomacy on occasion, sort of rogue diplomacy to, to really kind of hollow out and get ahead in those markets. And I'm just wondering, you know, how do we or can we break that dominance of China, particularly in the, the uh, critical mineral supply chain? And what can we do about that? Because, you know, uh, part of the, the reason and people were talking perhaps maybe more negatively about EVs is that particularly because of that dominance yes. and the supply. And, and Mr. Musk mightn't be as happy with uh, things at the moment either. That's absolutely right. China's gotten a head start in uh, my, primarily the processing of all these critical minerals. We've heard about it this morning, but it's also has strategic uh, partnerships around the world to get the raw material. And um, that's been long-term planning and so forth, but their dominance is not as great as it is, well, it is in rare earth minerals, 85 to 90 percent, but for the others, it's not total yet. Like, not like solar panels, 90%, maybe 60 to 70% of many of these critical minerals. And unlike oil, even though right now the mining is highly concentrated geographically, these, there are reserves of these critical minerals uh, in many places in the world. So that gives, that gives me hope that there, it is not too late for, uh, for Europe, for the uh, US, for other countries to develop, uh, you know, reduce their vulnerability to China's uh, dominance right now on critical minerals. And that is really important for our energy transition, for net zero. 
it's also really important as the demand continues to skyrocket, if we continue along the current path. So global demand for lithium is projected to grow 500% by 2030. And the IEA suggests that by 2050, to reach net zero, we have to triple the uh, global trade in these critical minerals. So you ask, what can, uh, what can the EU, what can the Europe, what can the, what can the US do? Uh, there's already a lot going on. We've heard a bit about that today. Uh, there's um, lots of work to develop their own um, supply chains. But I don't think it's wise or necessary for every country to have their own complete, or possible, for every country to have their own complete supply chain. And, so, and that's important also because a lot of the countries that are mining these minerals right now, they want to move up the value chain. They want to start processing themselves. So rather than just have it be a, a fierce competition, I have three suggestions. Um, one is to, to really, as, as our minister just talked about, focus on partnerships. Focus on partnerships between, among allies and partners throughout the world as Europe and the US are building up their own capabilities. And there's talk now uh, in Europe of something called the Buyers Club. That's one example of that. And there's already a US-led mineral strategic partnership. The EU is a member. India has just joined, a num number of other countries and states. And this is a way to pool resources and have tr strategic um, funding and dip diplomatic efforts to build up the supply chain. So that's one way that I think is very, very important. Another idea is to consider expanding the role of the International Energy Agency to develop and monitor uh, strategic reserves of some of the key critical minerals, just like uh, they do with oil. And um, that would require bringing in some of the countries that are no, uh, not currently members of the IEA but have these reserves. But I think that could really help to stabilize the market moving forward. And the third suggestion is really based on, we heard um, uh, today a talk about, a uh, mention of Avery Levin's soft energy path, that you have to look at the demand side. You have to not just figure out, oh, how are we going to meet all, like every, you know, every wind or solar plant having their own big battery. How can we reduce the demand for these critical minerals. And that range, there's many opportunities there that ranges from new R&D on new battery chem, uh, chemistries and electrolytes that don't rely as much on these critical minerals. Things like fast charging and battery swapping that allow for EVs that are smaller and have less range and therefore less critical minerals. Battery recycling, very important. Need to uh, need to ramp that up as, as quickly as possible. And for the energy storage, look at um, alternatives to battery storage. I mean, China's a world leader here in the pumped hydro storage, and they're trying to ramp that up. So one, uh, I'll, I'll end with one note of hope, and this is a recent report, an annual report, by Bloomberg New Energy Finance, where they rate 30 countries on how well they are doing in building a lithium-ion battery supply chain in terms of um, a whole range of issues. Is it sustainable? Is it uh, environmentally uh, friendly and so forth? And for the first time, China was not number one this year. It was Canada. It was Canada because of their continuous uh, you know, manufacturing advances, but also their strong ESG. And also as a friend shoring <laughs> partner with the US under the Inflation Reduction Act, they are moving ahead. So I think that's a good indication of where we can go. It won't be easy, but it's possible. Thank you very, very much. Um, if, Jim, can I bring you back in? Because we're kind of looking at risks and politics. Business as well can often be accused of being short term, but the kind of investment we're talking about here is titanic. It needs um, not just planning, not just policies, but it needs consistency and it also needs business models. Otherwise, you're going to have a risk of stranded assets or you know, businesses getting into trouble. So the, the scale of the investment is huge. So what are you doing to meet those challenges? Is there anything you think that's lacking at a policy level? You know, most governments are four years. They're not thinking the 20 to 30 years ahead for which many of these assets are. So I suppose um, when you look at the industry and where it is now, but where it was against 20, 2000, say, 
Um, the transition or the transformation even since then has been incredible. As Marguerite said, we have eight gigawatts of renewables on the system. People should reflect on that. Eight gigawatts on the system for a seven gigawatt peak. If, if you had said to anybody in 2000 that that was possible, people would have said that is not possible, it won't happen. So what it tells you is this is an energy industry that's used to transformation. The challenge that's facing us now is the acceleration of that transformation. It's much faster, it's much bigger, and the technology's coming quicker. That makes it harder and makes the risks greater. I suppose ESB has had to transition over those 20 years with that, and even in the last two years, in terms of the volatility that was driven by Ukraine was incredible. We're, we're through that now on a sound footing, I think, and we're, we have big investment plans in terms of the industry and driving that change forward to net zero by 2040. Are the business models there? I think the business models are there for a lot of things, right? So it's my first key point is, we have a lot already, you know, we built eight gigawatts, that didn't happen by itself. So there's a lot we can build on and we can keep moving on. There isn't an, an immediate break on all development at the moment, and that's really important. The second thing, which is an interesting challenge, and I said this to somebody last night, the amount of policy development that's going on at the moment in the industry is incredible. It's hard actually. 10 years ago, we would have been saying to government, more policy, more policy, more policy. As an industry now, we're struggling to keep up with the policy. There's that amount of policy coming. With all the reporting it's coming that so was quick. It. It's actually really challenging, and I mean that sincerely. It's very challenging. It actually brings maybe another risk. We're moving so quickly now. And is it going to be coherent? I believe it will be, but that's a challenge and it's something we need to recognize. It is very difficult now to keep up with the pace of that change, which is great to see. I suppose a few chestnuts, maybe the planning, and Marguerite said it, you know, there's new legislation coming, that's welcome. You know, what we're looking to do is go like that in terms of assets and, and driving out investments. That requires a new planning horizon. But I think the reality of it is industry has adopted. We're, we're actually fast-tracking projects into the planning cycle to force them through. That's, that's actually what we're doing. If we can actually speed up the planning cycle itself, that is good. That is good. It de-risks. It allows better projects to move quicker. Um, but it doesn't mean we're stopping. I think in terms of the grid, you know, as I said, I think Ireland is a world leader, at least it's very close to being a world leader. The issue is sustained, continued, growing investment in the grid. It's critically important. I'm a generator, I'm competing in a market, but there's no generation unless the grid keeps growing. It's also a very sensitive issue, particularly when you're looking at issues like data centres, so it's... It, it is a very sensitive issue, but the reality of it is, you know, and Jim Gannon talked about it, it is in the communication issue. We need to talk to people, this has to happen. We need to do it sensitively and we need to explain ourselves. And I think that's going to be a key challenge. We cannot take for granted, as Marguerite said, where people are in that understanding of why we need to change. We do need to change. I think the final thing I'd, I'd say for us when we look forward, we're investing very large amounts of money. That requires confidence, investor confidence over a long period of time. And I suppose. What we like to see is coherent, consistent signals to the market looking for assets. And I think the res type auctions that are coming now annually, that's brilliant. You can see line of sight, keep that coming across all technologies, do not change them regularly, make it consistent, and that's important. I think the second thing that I was delighted to hear Jim Gannon say this morning, which is important, we're investing in 40 year assets. The support structures are for 15 years. So we need to think that's okay now, but the penetration of renewables that's coming onto the system, the marginal price in the system will be moving towards zero. And How sir, does that make sense? Yeah. So we need, it was good to hear Jim say that regulators are thinking about that now. As we spend more and more money, the economic model to support renewables needs to sustain, endure and modify. And sir, you're obviously dealing with the clients day in, day out, and they're trying to navigate the transition and ever-evolving business models and I suppose what they're really wondering is that are they ultimately going to get access to finance so what do you think what are the handbrakes do you think that we need to release yeah so thank you so well I think a lot has already been said but I'll try to bring a bit, a bit more color to some of those elements um, but maybe before talking about how to release the handbrakes to go faster which is uh, always a great idea in the context of EVs but the, um, the, the, the one thing that we need to be very clear upon when you think at it from a consumer perspective, because ultimately this is about consumers, be it industrial clients or you know, end consumers, it's about them also buying new stuff. It's about applications. We talk a lot about the systems, but it's about applications. You know, we need to realize that you know, there's two elements to this, to this perspective. On the one hand, um, you know, every new installation that a customer buys now which is not clean, 
right? It's gonna last in the system for a very long time. A car will last 12 years, a gas boiler will last 20 years, you know, an industrial installation will last 30, 40 years, right? A coal, a coal plant or another industrial installation. So, I mean, we are competing against an alternative, and as much, you know, as we sold a lot of EVs last year, we did sell also 10 million petrol cars across the EU, right? That's about you know, 4 million-ish uh, uh, EVs. So, you know, that is, I think, an important realization. It also means that whatever we bring right now has to be cheaper and better compared to the alternative. Now, the, the four handbrakes that we typically call out, I mean, I'll start with the one that Jim was talking about, is finance. Yeah? I would say the key thing that industry, our investors, our clients are missing the most is indeed, is that line of sight, is that clarity. Um, cost of capital has gone up dramatically. Let's not forget about that. There's no free money anymore. So, you know, new capital deployment has become, I would say, less easy. And, you know, if you need to wait years and years and years for your connection, I mean, that kills your project altogether. So there's that element. By the way, again, back to the back very briefly, um, you know, emerging markets, Global South, I mean, they're looking at a capital cost not of 6, 7, 8%, but they're looking at 15 to 20%. So keeping that in mind, their problem is like a multiple, um, which I think is very alarming. The second one, so we spoke about the grids, um, but I'll, I'll just bring it to life because I think a lot has been talked about it. So, of course, there's no energy transition without our grids. But, you know, so we're just pre-released, so I can't disclose, but I'll plug, I'll plug another conference. I will plug the Euroelectric Power Summit in a couple of weeks. Um, so they will be releasing their grid for speed study. Um, so basically, we built a model with them where we've been modeling 70%, you know, the real data of all of the grid data, and then basically modeling uptake of all of those DERs, and then thinking about investment and what does it take. So I can't talk about the number, but of course, massive increases, as we all know. Um, but the debate, uh, quite, and we had regulators, we had the, Euro the European Commission with us. Everybody agreed, yes, the sizable investment has to happen, but the concern was all about, you know, what does it take to do this? Right? We're talking about millions of jobs that have to be added. Right? We're talking about an incredible supply chain you know, that needs to be built and that needs to be augmented compared to what we have right now. And so back to the industrialization, we can talk a lot about yeah, it's a big challenge and you know, we need to do this and we'll do it, we'll get it done. But I think we don't realize enough how big it is and how urgent it is taking into account that we need to compete against the alternative as I was mentioning. Right, and so I'll go a bit quicker, perhaps. But so the third one, other than Chris, of course, is the um, is the um, I would say the supply chain. And Barbara mentioned it. I'll summarize it: materials, equipment, and people. So I mentioned some of that. So that is, I think, a very big one. Um, and then the last one, of course, is consumers. So I'll keep my breath a little bit on that one. But you know, customer uptake. Um, we do have what we call a frozen middle. Um, we inquire about 30,000 clients every year uh, across the globe about 40% are what we call the frozen middle, meaning that half of the 40% cannot, and the other half will not participate to the energy transition. Cannot because they don't have the means, the rooftop, whatever, will not, they don't want it. Yeah. Can I, thank you, can I ask you, um, Avery, you know, maybe what are some of the biggest challenges you see, and particularly in the context of, I think a theme that has been really strong, like set by Michael from the very beginning is that whole notion of community engagement, because it's often the Cinderella um, of ESG, but we can't reach net to zero without citizens, without our communities. And I'm interested because you used to live in Guyana, and so you've a very, very, you've seen the climate crisis through a lot of lenses, but particularly through when you see those pictures of the global south and who's going to be most impacted. I'm just interested in your views on kind of the challenges and particularly how we move the conversation. I think one of the biggest challenges that we have in the transition to net zero at the minute is doing so in an integrated way. I don't, you know, I completely agree that I think we need to accelerate, and you know, that's the name of this conference, we need to accelerate as quickly as possible, but we also need to do so in a thoughtful, intentional, and intersectional way. Even bringing it back to China, it's an you know, incredibly interesting example. There's so much that's happening in the solar space, and at the same time, there's so much happening in the modern slavery space in the solar supply chain. And so if we are looking at this in an integrated, bringing global north and south together, and we don't look at it from a human cost perspective, we don't look at it from a biodiversity perspective, we really risk this, you know, as we're calling it, this new revolution, just replacing the existing systems of exploitation that we currently have. And we have an opportunity to, to really redo that entire model. And so, you know, I was down in Guyana for, for some time doing a research project, and um, we can talk about that another time because I really could go on about it for ages. But climate adaptation 
in that context is so interesting as a means of, you know, it's the fastest growing economy in the world at the moment um, because of oil and gas and because of the offshore uh, opportunity that's there. It's not being translated, you know, that opportunity is not being translated back into social infrastructure, into healthcare, into education, into jobs for the community. And so community engagement, both as a means of, you know, as you want to scale renewable projects, they, and we've heard it already today, can be a key inhibitor of actually scaling even the best of renewable projects or even the most green projects. Um, but they're also a key opportunity, and, and I think embedding community as part of this and, and bringing together that definition of just transition in a way that's not just jobs and it's not just... But, but, but the challenge that Barbara bringing together just transition is that for all of the appeals for global climate diplomacy, what we're actually considering is the spectre of trade wars, subsidy wars um, playing out, and we've, we heard it so about it so articulately well today. So in your view, are you a horseman or are you a superhero? Do you think it will hang together or, or fall apart? Yes, yes, okay. So um, my personal view on, there has to be a balance. There has to be a balance between the domestic industrial policy and trying to compete and develop competitive industries between tariffs and subsidies, carrots and sticks. And for China, um, it seems to me that the, um, the, the carrots, well, not just for China, the carrots are more effective and they're less likely to delay our global transition or race to net zero. And tariffs, we've seen, we've seen this. There's been 10 years of solar tariffs by the US on China. And they have succeeded to some extent in moving uh, production away from China into Southeast Asia, but using Chinese factories. So they're trying to plug that loophole. But it has not resulted in bringing solar production back to the US until the Inflation Reduction Act. And now we are seeing uh, 250 gigawatts of announced new products, over 80 f projects, over 80 facilities for solar, um, which is good. And companies are investing billions in the US because of the Inflation Reduction Act. But it's gonna be really hard, and you have to understand, well, let me just say that tariffs are also uh, cost consumers more, they cost jobs. In the US, who's opposing the solar tariffs? It's the solar industry of in people who install and maintain the solar panels. They're the ones that are losing jobs. Tariffs can be um, counterproductive, they can lead to retaliation and so forth. But for, for solar panels, um, the, f the fact of the matter is that China is dominating something up to 90% of solar cells. And what we have a situation now, it's not that they're subsidized uh, anymore, it's that it's become a hyper-competitive capitalist market where there are hundreds of companies fighting each other to bring price down in China and to completely continue to innovate. And that's what's making them better and cheaper than in the US, so it's gonna be very difficult to, to yeah. get there. Um, Jim, can I just come to you, because you just mentioned it in your last answer there, but I think it maybe would be interested a little bit more about that community engagement, because if we don't have community confidence, we, we won't get to, to where we want to go. And you know, we're, we're asking people to adapt, we're also gonna be asking them to pay. So especially when we're going to be navigating sensitive issues, and we mentioned whether there's a grid, data centers, whatever, what more do you need to do to empower customers and to give them that confidence to adapt and change? Well, I think, you know, there's two levels in engaging the community. The first one is, is events like today. Like, there is a need, and Jim Gannon said it as well, about the industry, I suppose, stepping up. He didn't quite say that, but I'm saying it. Stepping up and talking about what the transition will look like and, ha and you know, encouraging debate uh, in society around net zero. What does it mean? The why? People have to know why. Why are we changing? Why is this needed? Uh, and what do they need to do? So I think we need to do more. We need to talk about the value, not the cost. It's so easy to talk about the cost and not to talk about the value. As an industry, we need to talk about the value more and more. And I suppose it's really as an industry as well. Sometimes we talk about the fringe issues rather than 90% of the core, being positive about what we can do right now and moving the debate forward. And that debate does need to move forward. Um, you know, the society is coming with us, but this is getting harder now. 
you know, you can see what's happening in terms of, it, you know, installations, more community engagement. It is getting harder. It's getting quicker. So we need broader community understanding about what, what needs to happen. So I think from a societal point of view, the industry, I would say all of us have to step up. And I suppose that's what today is about. Yeah. Practically on the ground for any project, it's the same as it always was. You tell people what you want to do. You listen to them you listen carefully and you do what you say you were going to do. And if you do that over and over again, you build trust. If you don't do that, yeah, you build it's distrust. It's a, it's a, well, we wouldn't have time to even go into well, and how do you battle a lot of the misinformation and disinformation yeah. around these things. But um, sir, just finally to you, um, when Paul framed this conversation, really what he's saying is that the conflict is not about the direction we're going, but it's about the pace, the actions, the delivery and accelerating that. How do you think we, do we need to clarify the vision, do you think, in order to meet the demands of the tradition from a consumer community perspective, which is all of us? So, so I mean, talking about the vision, of course, is important. And I think a lot has been said and people, I think, increasingly and also unfortunately are seeing the consequences of, you know, yeah. I would say what the world could look like if we don't deal with the problem. Now, the reality, and again, back to, to what I said earlier, um, ultimately, if you look at the purchase decisions that people are making, um, you know, they are looking at, you know, money being spent right now. And, and therefore, I sort of stick with my mantra that we need to build solutions that are better and cheaper now, right, as opposed to something that might save the planet tomorrow. Um, I would say the good news is that with a lot of those new technologies, and we have four technologies across Europe, you know, rooftop solar batteries, EVs, um, and heat pumps that are on those exponential curves right now, even if, you know, they're slightly depressed at this point in time, but still, um, you know, so that, that's great. But, you know, if you want to sort of move past the 20% mark in terms of new sales of that equipment compared to the alternative, that means you're moving into mass adoption. Right? And you know, we'll only see mass adoption if it's simple, if it's better and cheaper. And so back to the, to the point that Jim was making, which is, and I'm violently agreeing with it, which is the value bit. Um, there's way more value in those assets, right? As in, there's money to be made with some of those assets. And I think we need to do a much better job, not just about talking about that value, but unlocking it, mm. right? If you think, for instance, about vehicle to grid, there's a lot talked about. There's simply, at this point in time, I mean, there's no provider that does this at industrial scale. We see pilots all over. And of course, you need fleet, you need flexibility, but you also need the market, right? So you need the price to be put on this. So it's complicated to unlock this. But, you know, a study, not by us, but in, in, in Australia, so I'll leave the numbers for what they are, claims that, you know, according to, you know, wherever in which uh, jurisdiction you're living, is that your car could unlock around 10,000 Australian dollars per year in flexibility value. Now, true or not, it just tells you that, I mean, if people would tell me that, I would buy two cars. Yeah, so I'm exaggerating, exaggerating, but just to land the point that we need to unlock the value. And the, the, the thing that I'm seeing very often right now is that all of those new technologies, they go through three, three phases, you could say, right? There will be an installation phase, which is what, will happen, what is happening now, right? Then there's an integration phase. Renewables is getting to that because it's creating intermittency, so we need to deal with integrating them. And then there will be more transformative. And what I'm seeing is that, you know, we need to quickly get past that sort of, or go to that integration, because this is where we will unlock value. In cars, the discussion is all about charging, but to be honest, charging is like, I mean, that should not be the point. If I'm driving somewhere, I mean, why? Because my car will tell me, drive there, charge there. If I share the data with the provider, they will know when I'm arriving, the charger will be free, available, will be working, and I could have other services at that point in time be delivered to me, my coffee, whatever I want. All I'm saying is there's much better experiences ahead of us, but we need to unlock, unlock, unlock all the it. Yeah. Barbara, very finally, oh, you want to Yeah, come in. just to follow up on your question about tariffs, I can't help but talk about the EU investigation into the dumping of highly subsidized electric vehicles in, in Europe. Um, number one, these vehicles are not being dumped at a lower cost in the EU than they are being sold in China. In fact, the cost of an EV sold in Europe is roughly double what it is in China. Number two, they're no longer highly subsidized. The subsidies have all been uh, rolled out. What we've got again is that hyper, hyper competitive situation where com companies are vying with each other to provide cheaper cars, more affordable ones with more options. I mean, just the other day, this smartphone company, Apple tried to do this with no luck, this Chinese smartphone company, Xiaomi, just came up with their own electric vehicle that is connected to people's uh, cars, uh, their cars, their phones, and connecting it with their homes. And they got 75,000 orders. 
on the spot. So tariffs on uh, goods are not going to uh, really support the development of Western automakers to be more competitive. It's just going to make it more possible for China to get a bigger market share of global markets around the world. And I think that Western car makers understand this. In fact, I'll close with a quote from the CEO of Volkswagen. He said, there's not been any, transfer, any country that has transformed the auto industry faster than China. And to us, this market is like a fitness center. We have to work harder and faster to keep up. Absolutely. Well, listen, well <laughs> it's been fantastic trying to keep up with a, with a really, really riveting conversation. Um, I guess um, th the conclusion of this conversation sort of brings us full circle because uh, our last speaker is going to speak to the uh, where we began with that beautiful image of uh, the Turlock uh, Hill Power Station and its uh, uh, 50 years in operation. So as we say goodbye to, uh, to Jim, to Serge, to Avery, and um, also to Barbara, let's uh, give a warm welcome to our final speaker, Paddy Hayes, Chief Executive Officer at ESB.